Hi, Professor. How are Hi. you? Hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you as well. Right. So, uh, yeah, let's start. So you are one of the world's leading philosophers that has made contributions to many philosophical areas. I mean, when I was an undergrad at Oxford, I had to wrestle with a lot of your views on epistemology, philosophical logic, and philosophy of language. So I'm kind of glad that I have this opportunity of asking you some clarifying questions that might have gone over my head as a student. So um, yeah, let's kick it off with a general question about philosophy itself. Uh, what do you think philosophy is? And what are the aims of this academic discipline? Well, I, I think academic disciplines in, in general are, I mean, they, they don't have, as were, very uh, nicely defined essences. I mean, they, they, they're often um, a mixture of different uh, sorts of things. And, uh, and that's particularly the case with, with philosophy, which, you know, in its history has had a kind of to some extent, a practical side where people went to philosophers for lifestyle advice, as it, as it were. Uh, but um, but I, I I think there is at its core, um, it, it, philosophy is it's fundamentally a, a kind of science, although um, not not a natural uh, science. It's not like physics or chemistry, and that uh, its main well the, the doing experiments is central to it and I, th I mean I think the kinds of questions that it um, asks are a very very general questions about the, the, the nature and existence of you know various um, kinds of thing and and um, and I, you know, a lot of philosophers think that philosophy is kind of radically different from other subjects. I mean, that for example, that philosophy is to do with asking sort of conceptual questions, um, as it were, questions about questions or something like that. Whereas, um, in my view, it's it's really not so different from from other subjects. It, it, it it's broadly concerned with with reality but with the, as with the more general and abstract aspects of of reality and um and within that i think there are lots of different kinds of question that can be asked and um that that may need to be answered in different uh, sorts of uh, sorts of way um so you know, I, I don't i don't think this is sort of one one size uh, fits fits all sort of uh, answer. But I, I mean, I think of, of, it's obviously very characteristic of uh, philosophy that uh, it does a lot of its work basically by thinking. I mean, you mentioned that uh, a while ago, philosophers were in the business of uh, a good lifestyle. Uh, but nowadays, my experience with analytic philosophy is that it doesn't really help you at all with that. Do you think that um, philosophy has, philosophy as is taught in university nowadays can help um, a graduate have a more fulfilled life? Well, I, th I think it can, if, if you're interested in, in philosophy. Um, and uh, so you can be fulfilled by, by doing uh, philosophy. Um, so, I, you know, I think, uh, I don't think this is something new about uh, philosophy. I mean, there, there are um, stories about, about uh, Plato giving a, a public lecture where all sorts of people came along and and they were deeply disappointed because they'd been hoping that he would um, sort of give them advice about how to be happy or how to get rich or something like that. And, and the whole lecture was about uh, oneness and twoness, and um, you know, and and they, as we were, you know, they 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 felt cheated. So you know, I don't I don't think that um, th that it's sort of new that uh, philosophers are often asking questions which are kind of disappointing to uh, to people who um, you know who come along. Um, you know, with with something more practical in in mind, but you know, I um, actually I, I once I, I once encountered a a, a graduate student um, who was um, I mean D Danish guy who 
who was doing analytic philosophy, but he'd he'd had a uh, a job in in a in a restaurant in Copenhagen, um, where you know at every lunchtime he'd be sitting at a table there with his um, books working. Uh, but if the if any the customers got into an argument, the 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 waiter would say to them, you know, excuse me, we do have a philosopher uh, available who could come and help you with your argument if you, if you like. And, um, and very often they said yes. And, um, and this was so successful that, that quite a lot of the customers started coming you know, every week so that they could have a discussion with the philosopher and so on. So, um, so the, the, I mean, and the kind of philosophy that he was trained in was, uh, was analytic philosophy so uh, you know it, it's not that um it it's somehow something that can only be helpful um to you if you know if you're in, involved in some very esoteric pursuit i mean i think you know a, a lot of the the kind of skills in you know in making distinctions and uh clarifying arguments and so on that that uh, analytic philosophers are very strongly trained in are in fact quite quite helpful uh, to uh, to people in in all sorts of walks of life. I mean, I you know I, I think that it, as with that that kind of clarific clarification and 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 probing of assumptions and and so on, it's, it's it, it can be relevant you know to things like thinking about whether one's life is worthwhile. <laughs> But this whole process of clarifying assumption, I guess, has to do with the fact that philosophers are, uh, are truth seekers and truth is a central topic uh, of philosophy. So last summer when I was, I think exactly one year ago, when I was on an airplane, uh, I read your book, uh, Tetralogue. Uh, and uh, th this entire text is a conversation between some people with very different worldviews and beliefs about the nature of truth. So... Can you please uh, tell us more about uh, this book and what motivated you to, to write it? Because I can guess uh, which one of the characters you could sympathize most with uh, at some point, but uh, still, I, I want to hear your story. Yes. Well, the, 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 the character that I, I, I'm, I'm closest to, for, for as anybody who knows me would, would guess, is in, in the book is actually... Um, uh, an autistic woman um, who seems <laughs> to be from Uzbekistan. So I mean, I, I did want to keep a little bit of distance uh, between my, <laughs> myself and um, and the characters. But it, it, I mean, the, the the reason that I wrote that book was because um, I I've been for a very long time disturbed by the the, the prevalence of relativist um, arguments um, and assumptions uh, in our culture more generally. I mean, ideas to the effect that, you know, as it were, one, um, one point of view is, is as good as, as another, <laughs> maybe as long as they're, you know, internally consistent or something like uh, like that, and that that, that there's that in you know, the fundamental um, disagreements that, that that there's there's no bottom line as to which view is correct, and and so on, and and this and kind of way of thinking, it's um, it's actually not very prevalent in analytic uh, philosophy, and um, and perhaps it's not so prevalent in in philosophy generally, but it's extremely influential. Um, I mean, both, I think, in, in the humanities uh, and social sciences, but uh, also in, um, in our wider culture. I mean, it's something, as it were, that you often run into in, in pubs and so on when, you know, when you start having a, a, a conversation that's getting uh, philosophical. Um, and, and it's something that I think many, many philosophers encounter, uh, particularly in, you know, first year undergraduates. Um, but which is, it's, it's difficult um, to, to engage with at, you know, at the kind of level that, that analytic philosophers, you know, tend to be arguing because it's actually, 
so so sort of shifty and unclear that, that if, I mean, because if you try to um, to give a a clear formulation of what the, the relativist idea is supposed to be, I mean, the, the they they tend just to you know collapse under their own weight, um, and um, you know, and although people have have you know, have done some work trying to make very, very limited forms of relativism uh, coherent. I don't, I don't think that's really what's behind uh, the the prevalence of relativism, you know, uh, within our culture more generally. And it's, you know, it's not, it's not what, um, you know, first year undergraduates are, are, are worrying about it. Um, I, I think, uh, as where it's some it's some kind of a, a, a idea as I say which is where if you put if you point out difficulties in one formulation people will just jump to a different formulation so that it, I think its roots uh, go go deeper than that and and so I wanted to to as it were write something that would bring out the the difficulties with with taking uh, the relativism seriously, um, not not for an academic audience, because I think it, as where the, the appeal is is in a way more primitive than that. But and so I wrote a, a dialogue, um, in in which um, one of one of the characters um, is a uh, sort of relativist of some kind. I mean, get, he's I mean, he himself is actually quite shifty in his relativism as, as the book goes on, because every time, you know, he gets into trouble with one formulation, he shifts to another, and so on. And um, and so I, th I thought that a, a dialogue was actually a, a sort of a better way at at getting at the the roots of relativism and and why, you know, many intelligent people find it an a, a appealing attitude, e even though it's it, you know intellectually in. <laughs> in such a catastrophic state, um, and so it, it seemed like you know that was a, a way of speaking to relativism as a cultural phenomenon, which I think is a more interesting question in a way than um, than relativism, you know, as um, a developed philosophical theory where you know there there isn't really very much to to confront. <laughs> But let's try to put this relativism a bit to the test uh, right now. I mean, I guess it's difficult to be a rel relativist about mathematical truth or, or scientific truth, at least uh, con concerning the hard sciences. Uh, but what about um, matters of uh, taste or uh, moral issues? I mean, if I believe that um, burgers are more delicious than pizza and uh, my girlfriend believes that pizza is more delicious than burgers, I mean, both of us make a taste judgment. Are you saying that there is an objective fact of the matter about which taste is superior in this case? Well, so uh, by the way, I, I, I should just qualify a little bit about the relativists. I mean, people who want to be relativists can, I mean, they may be relativists about mathematics. And, you know, in fact, um, the, there are versions of, you know, of a structuralist view where um you you think that sort of any 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 consistent mathematical theory is is true um uh, you know because the, the, the substructure where things work that way and i mean so you could be a, you could be a relativist about mathematics i don't, I don't think it's a, a satisfactory position but it's not as though that there's something about the nature of mathematics which completely blocks relativism um, and I, you know, I think it's important, often with relativism, that I mean, people make these these moves in in kind of very limited uh, situations, but um, I mean, but often don't realize, as it were, how how uh, um, far-reaching they, they 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 implicitly are. I mean, in, so I mean, in the case of the example of taste, uh, which you mentioned. Um, I mean, I think actually, I mean, relativists d d don't always do a very good job even of describing what the linguistic phenomena, phenomena are. I mean, in the sense that, you know, if somebody, um, if somebody says that um, 
that burgers are delicious. Um, that is not intended as a statement just, you know, in effect, just about themselves. Uh, it's intended as, you know, some kind of limited generalization. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I think, you know, if it turns out that, um, for example, you know, of course, this isn't true with burgers, but if, if, it, if it, let's say the burgers at a particular place, if they, if it, you know, if somebody um, said that the burgers at such and such a place were delicious, and then it turned out that they had some um, very odd um, physical condition, which affected their sense of taste, and so that everybody with a normal sense of taste found the burgers at this place disgusting, then, then I think, you know, th that would seem like pretty good evidence that, that their statement was simply false. And the fact that they found these burgers um, d delicious, what was, would be more a sign of um, something strange about uh, their sense of, of taste than of, of, of anything else. And I think, I think the person who'd made the statement once, you know, once a doctor explained to them you know what, what had happened to their taste system. Let's suppose would um, would very likely withdraw their general claim and but, and would say something much more uh, limited, um, like you know, uh, well, uh, they taste delicious to me or something like that. And then the, the statement that you know that they taste delicious to me is is one which may well be true, but but true simply, um, you know, in a, a a non-relativist way. It's just a fact about that person's um, sense of taste. Um, you know, and I, th I think, I mean, of course, often there's a kind of um, context sensitivity with taste judgments that that they're really, um, you know, that, that they're judgments well, I mean, you could compare it to the, you know, when somebody says it's raining, um, that, that, you know, what, what, although they don't say it's raining here, there is an implicit um, restriction in their statement to, to, to rain <laughs> around where, where they are. And, you know, and so, um, you know, if we could easily have two people um, in, you know, let's say talking by phone and in, in, in different, Different parts of England. It doesn't need to even need to be different parts. It's an international case where where and one of them is truly saying it's raining because it's, it's raining where they are, and the other one tr is truly saying it's not raining because it's not raining where where they are. And um, you know, and it's. I think it would be ridiculous to use examples like that to argue for some kind of relativism. I mean, what, what they show is, is rather that, um, the, the, the statements that they're making have some kind of um, implicit qualification to, in this case, to, to where the rain is supposed to be happening. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and then once, once you've taken account of the, the implicit qualification to, to reign in, in a particular region, then the statement that they're actually making is simply objectively uh, true or, or false. And uh, although you know, it takes uh, some work to argue this, I, I think things are actually very similar, even in the case of taste, that, that people are, uh, when they talk about taste, that they're making statements which may be implicitly limited as to, you know, to, to whose taste is in question or something like, like that. Although it's not usually limited to, to just the, the one person who's, who's speaking when, when we say things like burgers are delicious. Um, but once you've taken account of those kind of contextual aspects, uh, which are just you, there to, as it were, to help us interpret what statement the person is making, then the statement itself is uh, uh, objectively true or, or false. So, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not really moved by um, 
you know, people who claim that that we, we at least need relative some kind of relativist view for um, judgments of of taste. I, I think that the 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 way people jump to to relativist conclusions there is it's really because they, they they haven't looked carefully enough, you know, just at what the phenomena are, even when we're talking about taste. But what what about um, let's step outside the taste uh, zone and and focus on something a bit more loaded, namely the the area of uh, moral judgments. I guess you agree that uh, distant cultures might have engaged in practices which they were okay with, which we now might find even morally reprehensible. So a lot of people might use these sort of intuitions. I don't want to give a precise examples. Perhaps you have better ones in mind. Uh, that what we may find moral may be just a byproduct of our um, cultural differences. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I mean, one would need much more than that to support uh, to support relativism because, um, you know, it, after all people's judgments for or against the theory of e evolution are very strongly influenced by their cultural background too. I mean, you know, if, if, if you've been brought up, uh, you know, in some kind of liberal, secular Western society, you're, you're much more likely to, to um, be in favor of the theory of evolution than if you've been brought up by you know by religious fundamentalists um, and um, I mean that doesn't mean that there's no right or or wrong uh, answer to the the question um, I you know I think it, 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 people jump you know too easily from well look, here's a here's a, a dispute that there doesn't seem to be any prospect of settling um, to oh well, there's no right answer. But you know, even if you have a dispute between an, a supporter of evolution and a creationist, um, the neither side is going to convince the other. Uh, it, you know, it's it's just a, it's we're just as sort of deadlocked in a way as um, as in the case of um, the the dispute between different different moral views and. So the, I mean, the mere fact that we've got an argument, um, which where, where where it's pretty clear that neither side is ever going to convince the other, that doesn't mean that that there's no right or wrong about it, and it doesn't even mean that n that neither side knows which is right or wrong. It it, it just means that um, you know sometimes um, it makes a difference whether you've had an uh, access to the you know a right sort of education or or not um and you know and i and i i don't so i don't regard the the existence of uh of moral uh disagreement um you know as as showing that that there's no the correct answer in the in the case of uh morality um and and in fact i think it's It, it's very difficult to be a moral relativist because it, you know it's very it's very difficult to um, to avoid moral judgments um, and um, and it, and you know and I think of course the, you know various philosophers have tried to show. Um, uh, how you can make moral or, or things which look like moral judgments um, and and yet um, you know not be committed to the idea that there's really any any such thing as a moral truth or whatever. But but though the kind of accounts that they've given of the way that moral language works um, have I mean have in my view, but I mean this. Is, actually quite widely held, have, have really just failed simply from the point of view of philosophy of language, that, that they, don't, they don't explain how, how moral language can, can work in this kind of uh, way. And um, you know, so I think, I think it's, if, if, 
if you're going to go in for um, for moral judgment, um, then it's it's very hard to give an, a, a, a coherent account of what's going on that doesn't involve the idea that that you're making true or or false statements, um, and uh, and where again. I mean, the, the relativist doesn't seem to have a, actually a, at all a good account of how moral language works. I mean, of course, uh, you know, it's it's a difficult question. Um, just just you know, what is um, you know what what would what, what would make moral statements be true or, or false? But um, I mean, as and, you know how how it is that we're all latching on to um you know the, the same subject matter um but you know I, I don't think that's really an issue issue about moral relativism which as i said i don't actually think gives us a, a, a better uh account of what's going going on um i mean i think I mean, one way of thinking about it is is something like this: that 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 when we um, when we start thinking about good and and bad, we're not. I mean, we're not immediately talking about what's morally good or bad. Uh, you know, so that, for example, um, you know, when um, when you've got a, a a hunter and and the the prey that they're hunting, then um, the, the what's what's good for one is bad for the other. I mean, it's good for good for the hunter to catch the the prey, and it's good for the prey not to be uh, caught. And um, and so the 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 I mean, they're making. I mean, the, we might as it were if we put their judgments into words, we might say that the hunter is thinking it's it's good to, for me to catch the prey, and and the prey is thinking it's bad for me to, to be caught by the uh, the hunter, but those those are not moral judgments uh, at all. And in fact, the the kind of good and bad that, that's at issue seems to be some very local one. And it seems that as it were, each side is making a correct judgment about what's good or or bad, because the the goodness and badness is is something local. And then you know, obviously, we we move up from thinking about just what's good or bad for uh, single individuals to what's good or bad for a, a group of individuals and then maybe you know, to for all all members of our species and then maybe to you know, all members of all species and so on. and and so um, we're we're looking as it were for um, some standpoint to judge which is it's less and less tied to the specifics of anyone's situation and quite and to, and it's a way to achieve some kind of universality um but yeah i mean you know that's that's not an easy thing to to do and just how how far it can be done um is is unclear but you know i think it's um i mean that's after all uh, not totally unlike a process that's gone on in in science where we've started out making judgments about uh, our local environment and so on and then we gradually move up from that to making judgments about the whole uh, universe so um you know it it's not it's not something that's uh, as a word that makes no intellectual sense uh, at all even though it's uh, it's it's difficult but um and and of course the fact that that it's hard to come up with a a universal theory doesn't mean that we don't know a lot at the more local sort of sort of level um and you know, so you know i th i think that understanding what's g going on there is i mean of course there is a, a lot to be understood but um I, I don't think that that relativism has really m made a, any significant contribution to understanding that kind of issue. I, think. Uh -huh. I was wondering whether uh, audiences that might listen to this and they are interested in concept of truth 
you might have any tips into how you might seek the truth about general about issues pertaining either to uh, things that are deemed objective by most of people but also uh, moral judgments and things of this sort I mean how can they sort out these things for themselves well so I think one you know one thing is you know what what truth is and another is how you you find out what's true and um and there is there is a quite a large gap between um those those two things i mean so i mean the the general nature of truth is is one which has in very broad terms actually been understood since uh, the time of plato and aristotle and if not not before i mean and roughly speaking you know aristotle said that you know to to say of what is that it is um, and of, of, and of what is not that it's not it is true and to say of what is that it that it isn't and of what isn't that it is is false and i th i think that that's fundamentally uh correct and uh, of course it's not very you know informative about you know which particular things are true and which aren't but uh that's because the, the notion of uh, truth and the distinction between truth and falsity is it's a broadly logical one and um, and so when you're explaining, you know, broadly logical ideas, you, you tend not to get into specifics about uh, how, how you find them. Out. I mean, I, you know, and then the kind of rough analogy would be, um, you know, it, when a child asks, you know, let's say, what's a spy? Then you, you give them some, some kind of account, you know, of, of what, what it is to be a spy, that, you know, you're somebody who, let's say, um, finds out um secrets without letting you know for for um for, for somebody and 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 um and carries you the secrets away and reveals them to somebody to whom they're not meant to be revealed you know just some story along those lines that's what it is to be a spy but um you know when you once once a child has understood what it is to be a spy that that doesn't mean that they're going to be any good at recognizing who uh, amongst their acquaintances actually is a spy and and who isn't i mean it it's uh, that's a different uh, question um and you know and i think the i mean the question of you know of how we find out what's true and what's false is basically just a question of well how do we find out stuff at all uh, you know how do we how do we get to know things and um and then you know, and there, I mean, there isn't going to be any simple answer to the question. Well, how do you find find things out? I mean, you know, the the useful answers are going to be, you know, of a somewhat more specific kind. I mean, it depends what sort of question you're asking. What you know, what methods are are useful? Um, and you know, of course, something like like logic is kind of um, applicable in principle everywhere but but most questions can't be answered by logic alone and i mean you know most most questions are um are ones that um that require some some kind of specific method to answer i mean you know in for example in the philosophy of science um you know in the the, the 1950s people were talking about you know what what is the scientific method and trying to give some formulation of you know the scientific method and and i think that that approach turned out not to be terribly fruitful now and and you know my sense is that philosophers of science these days um, and they're much more interested in looking at what particular methods are used by particular sciences for dealing with particular problems and so on and that they're finding that there's much more you can say that's useful at, at that more kind of specific level um, rather than at the very general level of well you know how do you make a scientific discovery and um, and I think all all of that kind of advice about you know how, about what what methods you use for answering particular kinds of 
question and so on. I mean, all of that is implicitly ad advice about how do you find out what's true and what's false. I mean, you know, if you're asking, um, you know, what caused this phenomenon or something like that, you, then you're basically asking to, you know, to distinguish true hypotheses about what caused the phenomenon from false hypotheses about what, what caused the phenomenon. So that in a way, the words true and false are, are not really adding anything very much. And that's, that's kind of what you'd expect, um, you know, given the, the broadly logical nature of, of truth and falsity. Speaking of logic, you're, uh, you're a major fan of uh, classical logic, which is the, the logic on which mathematics seems to operate. And um, issues in philosophy of language have um, placed a question mark over, cla well, over whether classical logic really captures what we want it to capture in natural language. So, for instance, take the phenomena of vagueness for which you've given a book length uh, treatment. Um, so, some while ago, I had a, a head for, full of hair now I'm bold, but presumably at some point in the past, I was uh, a borderline case of bold. So uh, at that point, uh, the, the sentence, Teddy is bold. Uh, I know people would be reluctant to call that either true or false. So it would reject one of the uh, basic principles of classical logic, namely the law of excluded middle, that everything is either true or false. W what do you think about this uh, attack of, on classical logic? Yeah. So... So what, one thing is, uh, I mean, the, the way people used to defend classical logic was, oh, you have to res obey classical logic because otherwise you'll just be talking li literal nonsense and nobody will be able to make any sense of what you're saying and so on. And, you know, and I, d I don't think that's right. I think it's perfectly intelligible for people to question classical logic. It, you know, the, the principles of classical logic, you know, are, they're not utterly I indubitable. Um, but we have to look at you know how good the the case against them actually is. So if we take the case of vagueness, um, well, I, I think what's clear is that there was a time when during that uh, unpleasant process when people you know were, were um, you know if they if if they were asked the question is is Teddy bold and with you standing there in front of them. Um, they just wouldn't have known what to say, or, or maybe they would have, some people would have said yes, and some people would have said no, and some people have said, I don't know, and some people have said it was a borderline case, but it was, I mean, they, they would, would not, they certainly wouldn't be able to, to come to any agreement about what the answer was. Um, and, you know, and I think once they'd seen that, they might, they might feel that they, um, they didn't know that you were bold, and they didn't know that you were not bold. Um, but then I think uh, beyond that, it's a, a, a more theoretical question. Well, what's going on there? And, you know, and, and of course, I mean, some people have had the thought, well, classical logic is, is based on the, the principle of um, bivalence, which every statement is either true or false. And, and by the way, not both. And, um, and, and people have thought, well, maybe, um, we need to, we we need to loosen that up and and replace the, this dichotomy of truth and falsity by something more like a continuum of degrees of truth and you know i mean that sounds not a crazy idea when you first think of it but w one of the things i was doing in that book was saying okay let's actually see how these alternative uh accounts uh work um and it's it's once you start looking into the details of them, you you see how how weak they actually are. The, and and the, the thing that typically gets them into trouble is what's called higher order vagueness, which is the fact that it's it, um, that it's not just that it can be vague whether things are a certain way or not, but it can be vague whether they're vague and, you know, so you can have borderline cases of borderline cases and so on ad infinitum. So what you're saying is that during this process, uh, there might be a vague area in which people could not really decide whether I'm bold or not, but then you have the problems of calibrating these margins uh, of this interval of time. I mean, it's vague whether 
my balding process starting here and ended here and I mean this this is higher order vagueness right yes yeah so that if 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 supposing that we had a, a whole series of shots of your scalp you know one for each day you know for for this you know the decade of this process or whatever and then if people had to classify you on the basis of these pictures as bold or not bold um they would have there would be many many cases where they wouldn't be at all sure what to say but the the higher order vagueness is so if we told them okay so you can classify it as bold or borderline or not bold they would also have been in trouble with lots of these cases about whether to classify them as bold or as borderline i mean you know so that the as it were the borderline zones themselves have borderline zones and and the the kind of um the kind of fuzzy logic which was based on that idea of uh, of uh, degrees of uh, of truth uh, has had enormous problems uh in in handling uh, higher order vagueness and in fact really all the um the non classical approaches have have trouble with with higher order vagueness but uh, is the failure of these approaches um something in favor of an approach that doesn't seem to do justice to our intuitions i mean namely the ones that preserves classical logic i mean sh shouldn't we also say that all approaches just seem to not work out well i mean i don't think it's really uh, you know a matter of um intuition i mean one thing is i mean the intu what we're talking about as intuitions here are um they're just um pretty much off the cuff judgments that people make about questions that they haven't thought about very much <laughs> um and um you know and so of course in the case of something like you know wh whether somebody's bold or not bold i mean you know we've we've had a lot of practice in making those judgments and we're we're okay at doing that but um but then you know when it comes to uh making judgments about well oh is this a case where um we've got a statement which is neither true nor false well, we're getting we're getting to something that's that's much more theoretical um and you know, I, I don't think that the, the mere fact that, you know, let's say, you know, you know, when you, if you do an opinion poll, um, that, you know, the classical logic, you know, let's say it only scores 46% or something. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think one should be doing logic by opinion polls. Um, you know, I think it's, it's much more um, a, a matter of trying to find out which, which theories actually uh, work um, where you know we've got we've got a certain amount of um, data to go on. There, there is the stuff that we that we do know. I mean, we you know we know of some people that they're bald and of others that they're not bald and and so on. And and so there's you know there's data of that kind. But and then we want to to find what the the best way of of reasoning about this is. And um, and, and what happens is that we've got all these non classical approaches which um get into you know a lot of trouble once we start probing them on things like higher order vagueness and are um they're much more complicated than classical logic and they're also less powerful than classical logic in the set normally in the, the, with most of them there's actually um there's actually much less reasoning that they allow you to do than classical logic does. Um, and, you know, and so, I mean, you know, cl classical logic is, roughly speaking, is the simplest and strongest of the alternatives. Um, and, um, and, and when you start thinking things through from a classical perspective, you see that the kind of, the, diff the borderline cases that we come across. I mean, they're, um, they're something that you'd have predicted from a classical point of view w w once you got a certain amount of epistemology of theory of knowledge, because, um, you know, they would say, well, you know, if it's 
assuming that there is a, a borderline between um, bold and non-bold, so, you know, since, since we, we, nobody has available an accepted definition of bold in terms of number of hairs on your scalp or whatever, I mean, we, we would not expect um, to be able to know exactly where the borderline comes. And so, you know, it's, it's just no surprise that we'd be ignorant and uncertain in a certain, in a particular zone. And, you know, and I think one, one thing that the people working on vagueness have often not understood is, I mean, I think their attitude is that, oh, if we, if we, dump classical logic for some other kind of logic for, for vagueness, we can still keep classical logic for mathematics because mathematics is precise. I mean, so that, you know, they feel there's no kind of cost to mathematics in giving up classical logic. But once you start looking at applied mathematics, where we're actually using mathematics, you know, in physics or, you know, or just in very, ordinary situations where we're talking about, you know, uh, the number of apples and oranges in a bowl or something like that. Um, you've got mathematics being applied, but in situations where we're, we're dealing with vagueness in some way. I mean, you know, so that, for example, um, you know, we, if supposing that we were doing some kind of, um, let's say, statistical analysis of um you know boldness in in different uh, parts of the world or something like that we, we would um we would be using mathematics but we'd also be talking about boldness and um you know and even of course and even if you try to introduce a precise definition of of boldness um you know it you know let's say in terms of the number of hairs on your uh, head i mean you know then you get into further vagueness about what counts as a hair and and so on and um you know and so once we're dealing with the you know the world that we experience in sense perception uh the world that we see and hear and smell and so on um we're we're going to be using terms that are more or less vague but we're we also want to be able to use mathematics um and um these non-classical theories of vagueness have really never made a serious attempt to, to explain how that's going to work. Whereas with classical uh, logic, we've got a very smooth account of, of how um, we can apply mathematics, you know, even when we're using vague language. So, you know, it seems to me that the, the classical approach um, is, is just way ahead of um the the, the non-classical ones and and there's there's really nothing that they gain i mean they you know because they they don't even um in the end produce results which are more intuitive although as i say i don't regard that as the most important crit criterion but, i mean if you insist on keeping classical logic i don't think we spelled out some implications of this namely that you believe that there is a precise sharp, sharp cutoff in this process of bolding where I finally crossed the line and now I'm bold and previously I was not. And I guess your view, again, from a God's eye point of view, might have some the following implications. You believe that in the process of development uh, from, uh, there is a precise cutoff when, when a fetus becomes a baby. So I guess this might have moral implications uh, in the case of uh, an Alzheimer's patient. Uh, uh, you might believe that there is a sharp cutoff when that person is not there anymore because of uh, brain degeneration. I guess, again, from a God's eye point of view, you, you don't have a lot of legal disputes. I mean, in, in the context of law, you have a lot of vague terms. So I, I guess this debate is relevant for a lot of things that we actually care about. And you believe that we might not have epistemic access to that sharp cutoff, but nonetheless, it's it's really there. I mean, I remember... Richard Dawkins published a, a book called The Magic of Reality, and uh, in that book he has an essay entitled Who Was the First uh, Human Being, or something like that, and he yes. just says that for a thought experiment that imagine yourself uh, in a photograph, and then you have a photograph of your father, and then a photograph of your father's father, and you iterate that to, I think, uh, 
185 million generations. So you have a whole stack of photos. And now you go through these photos and ask which is the first, uh, uh, which is the first human being. Dawkins concludes that there is no first human being because uh, any offspring of some species would be classified as a member of that species. So you, you sort of get this right as sort of paradox. Yes. But you, yeah, you, no, so yeah, I mean, I guess he's saying that if, if, you're, if you're human, then your parents are human. That would be the way it, it, it goes. Yeah. And, but then the thing is, I, I, he, I'm not sure that he's, he's fully thought that through. But I mean, I, he's a colleague of mine, so I could ask him sometime. But, but I mean, it, you know, if you, if you, if you take the um, the principle that that every human is a child of a human, um, you can just using the mathematical uh, principle of you know of induction, um, you can you can get that all your ancestors were human. Um, you know, you know, as far as as far back as it goes. You know, I mean, you know, to whatever mammals. <laughs> so I, I mean, the top of the pile, you'll have a fish. <laughs> exactly, and and the thing is that, um, but I, I don't think the way to solve that paradox is by rejecting a piece of per, a, a perfectly good mathematical principle, the principle of mathematical induction, which. Um, you know, basically, I mean, putting it in terms of numbers says that if, if zero has a property and, you know, and whenever a number n has a property, then, then n plus one has a property, um, that, that then all natural numbers, all the numbers, zero, one, two, three, blah, 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 uh, they all have this property. I mean, there's perfectly good mathematical principle. And, um, and if you, you know, if you say that there was, that there was no, you know, that the, Every human is a child of a of a human. You and of course you, you have to acknowledge that, that at some point this fish was not was not a human. Uh, you you're going, going to end up um, you know rejecting standard mathematics. And you know it seems to me that um, you know standard mathematical principles are a way um, more secure than you know than principles like the that any human is a child of a of a human. Um, and and so so what we should be doing is is keeping keeping the mathematics, which is the safest part, and um, and then questioning the, you know the assumption that that every human is a child of a of a human. Um, I mean, I, I perfectly agree with you. I'm, I mean, if you if you take classical logic on board, you have to admit that there has to be a photo in there where you you can show to your interlocutor the first human being on that on that particular list. So I was thinking about the thought experiment uh, before this interview to ask you. So I know, imagine a world where you're on a football stadium with all the versions of yourself starting from 10 years old until now. So you have 10 years old, 10 years old in a day. So you have a lot of uh, Professor Timothy Williamson's uh, in development and you, you are asking uh, yourselves to divide you uh, into those members that are in the extension of the adult predicate and those that are not. You're saying that this division can be precisely done. But I'm wondering, I don't know, if, if God could say the message yeah, this is how the division should be done. Nonetheless, your view also says that you cannot know whether that division is correct or not. And I'm wondering why you can't discuss among yourselves and finally be content with the idea that the division has been done appropriately. Because your epistemic view also says that you cannot, you cannot know where the boundary uh, lays. Yeah, so I mean, some, some people uh, who have this kind of view of va vagueness, like uh, Roy Sorensen, for example, Think that this is this is an absolutely in principle can't can't know that um, that it doesn't just does somehow doesn't make sense to uh, to know. Um, I'm I'm actually less strict than than that. I mean I think what's clear is that we have um, we have no idea how to f how to answer these questions. I mean. Well, of course, with adult, maybe oh, on your eighteenth birthday or something. But um, but but at least there are plenty where you know, let's say, with the term was mature or something, which is yeah, maybe. Big. But um, that we have no idea how to answer them, and that if we 
if we tried to, uh, you know, to agree, it, well, we probably wouldn't be able to agree. And if we did agree, it would, the, the, the most likely reason would be that um, some forceful personality uh, persuaded us all just to sign on to some view because because that way we, we would we'd be able to leave the experiment and get on with our lives or something like that. I mean, it wouldn't be there wouldn't be anything. Uh, it wouldn't be a genuine discovery. It would just be you know some kind of r random as we're compromised just for the for the sake of peace. Um, but um, so you know so that the. You know, we we wouldn't we wouldn't be finding out anything like like that. But you know, I, I'm I'm very wary of of saying that um, that some questions are just you know unanswerable, you know, by their very nature. Um, I mean, you know, if if you look at you know John Locke in the seventeenth century. I mean, he th he thought that all sorts of questions, which have subsequently been answered uh, by modern science, you know, in terms of you know what the what's happening at the microscopic level. I mean that that, that they were they were beyond the reach of human knowledge, um, and you know, and so I you know I don't want to insist that um, you know it, it, it simply clearly you know m metaphysically impossible for us ever to to know the answer to these questions i all, all i'm just is that uh we have absolutely no idea how to find out you know there isn't there's we don't really have any kind of research program that would lead to an answer or anything like that um you know but it i mean the idea that you know a thousand years from now people might have learned enough that they actually found a good answer to these questions. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think we should be too confident that that won't happen. In the case of boldness, a lot of textbooks and papers on vagueness assume, or at least it seems to me that they assume that vagueness is a function of the number of hairs that you have on your head. So the argument goes that you're clearly bold, you're clearly not bold with, I don't know how many hairs it takes not to be bold. So if you are at that level, it doesn't really matter if you pluck one hair out because you'll still be not bald. But you, if you iterate through this conditional at some point, you'll have zero hairs on your head, so you're clearly bald at that stage. Uh, obviously, this argument is a bit odd because baldness is not a function of the number of hairs. I mean, otherwise hair transplants wouldn't work. You just take some hairs from here and you distribute them around and suddenly people do not judge you anymore as bald. But you have the same number of hairs on your head. So it seems to me that the act of labeling some, someone bald or not is not in terms of how many hairs they have on your head. It is sort of an internal mental judgment. And I was wondering whether uh, your sharp cutoff account only works in, the, in this case where you have a situation that has a discrete flavor, namely zero strands of hair, one strand of hair. But if you have something like distinction between night and day, and you, you have a continuous time between this, I mean, you cannot have this conditional with n and n plus one that might make a difference. Uh, does your position apply even in those cases where you don't have, uh, you cannot apply mathematical induction because things are not uh, discrete, so to say? Yeah. Oh, it yeah, definitely applies to that. I mean, you know, I think the the assumption that that whether you're bald just depends on the number of hairs on your head is, I think, is one that most people in the area uh, actually know is is a kind of idealization that, it, or as, as, as a simplification, just for the sake of of argument. Um, so, I mean, if we took um, the, you know, let, let's let's just to keep things simple and you know not have to worry about sort of clouds and all that sort of thing i mean just take us a, a situation where we're in a room and and we've got some kind of an, a, a light which is being gradually dimmed and the dimming is happening in you know in a continuous way so it's getting and darker and darker so we start off with where the, the room is definitely light and then we end up with, with the room definitely dark and you know but it's, it's a completely continuous process um there then um so what classical logic will tell you is that um 
let's let's just focus on the question of whether it's dark or not. There's, at every moment, it's either dark or not dark. Um, and it, it also tells you, I mean, well, something that's not just pure logic, but just has to do with the setup of the situation is that if at, at any moment in this process, it's dark, then it will be dark for all later moments because, because it's, it's getting darker and darker. And, um, and, let, and, and then the, I mean, the normal way of modeling that situation would be thinking of the, the moments of time as being uh, ordered in the same way as the the you know as an interval of the real numbers let's say from from zero to one or something like that and so the so what we're talking about is the the, uh, the set of moments um, which uh, you know are, are when it's dark and and we know that you know that for for any moment in in that section that all the later moments are dark and that, and and then just by a bit of ordinary classical mathematics that that tells us that there will be a a point such that that no moment before it is is dark and every moment after it is dark and then it it doesn't actually tell us whether that moment itself is dark or not dark but it's going to be one or the other and so um so that in in that case you need a little bit more than just pure logic you need you need a little bit of um classical mathematics but but using that classical mathematics you you do get the conclusion that there is, um that there is a cut off moment such that every moment before it, it, it it's not dark and every moment after it it is it is dark so um that you know i think the the approach it doesn't really depend on the fact that you're d dealing with uh, discrete quantities but okay uh, let's keep another uh, sort of continuous uh, example it seems to me that your account presupposes that um, these predicates uh, latch onto sort of objective properties in the world that have to be sharp so i don't know instead of dark let's take a color predicate such as red and ha let's have a color spectrum ranging from um, white to red so at some point you'll have pink uh, here you have definite redness and you are saying that at some point you'll have a sharp cut off when I'm looking at a red color. And before that, you don't have it. But I find it implausible to, to say that um, red actually latches onto a sharp objective property in the world just because a lot of people use, I mean, I guess the meaning of the word is derived from its use, but the way red may be perceived by a lot of speakers may, uh, may not be uniform. I mean, you have red, green, colorblind people that are not fully colorblind, but can use the world word. I'm not sure whether everyone sees the color in the same way, but nonetheless, they manage to synchronize just enough for speech to be meaningful. In your account, it seems to me that that red predicate latches on to something objective that is generated by the uses of a lot of speakers that might not really see the same color, but they might agree on the definite instances of the color. And I don't know how the sentence I don't know this color is red can be objectively true or not and not from the perspective of the particular user for me it would be a red for teddy and red for professor williamson that might latch onto an objective uh, color in the world but i don't know whether that redness is human independent yeah so well i think i mean the case, with the case of colorblindness if if colorblind people are just less good at making certain discriminations then it's not exactly that's not exactly uh, you know, a, a symmetrical situation between them and people who are better at making those discriminations. But I mean, let's just suppose that you're right. I mean, suppose it's the case that the word red expresses a different property depending on who's using it. I mean, I don't, I don't, in fact, believe that. But let's just just grant that um, because I mean that hypothesis is um, is perfectly consistent with classical logic. Actually, I mean that 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 it should the word red should just express different properties depending on who you see. And in the same way, for, for example, that you know if you take the property that we that you know I express by the, using the word mine, um, you know the, the the laptop on which I'm um, talking to you is is mine. But of course, if you know, it wouldn't be true for you to say the words it, that laptop is mine. You know, referring to my <laughs> laptop, so that you know the, the 
the word mine, roughly speaking, expresses the property of belonging to the the, the, the speaker, or um, and and so that's a, a different property depending on who the speaker is. But then it would still be the case that what, you could apply classical logic to that property, and that everything either has the property or doesn't have the property. Right. So you know, it's it's not really that that a whole lot of extra assumptions are being made about uh, what properties there are. It's it's really just classical logic that it, that is driving all, virtually all of this reasoning. Or you know, in I mean, in the case of the um, the light dimmer example, um, we, I was using a bit of of classical mathematics, but I wasn't I wasn't using some kind of special metaphysical theory about the nature of properties but this wouldn't this change the discussion a bit i mean if there would be redness for every individual i mean this would change the flavor of uh red has a precise sharp of a sharp cut of even in legal or uh moral disputes i i guess it, it would really matter if the predicate would be really person independent that would not latch on to an objective property in the world wouldn't it i do, I, I mean i think these the discussion you know has uh, it's covered all these different kinds of cases at one time or or another um and you know I, I, as i say i mean it's not i mean i would i'd be perfectly happy to apply the the, the term red um to you know in, in in a way that i mean i take it um it does ex express the same property uh whoever's using it although it, it's there may be some other kind of contact sensitivity that's involved with red, but I, I mean, I think relativizing it to the individual speaker is not very plausible. But the point I wanted to make is that 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 commitment to the idea of of shared uh, properties, which different people may be better or worse at at uh, recognizing, um, it isn't the key to the uh, the kind of view of vagueness that I'm def defending. I mean, the view uh, is. It's basic basically works in the same way um which, whichever way you go on on that actually is it the the case of the law that uh, you you mentioned a couple of times is is interesting because of course i mean although you know generally uh, you know an attempt is made to to make laws relatively precise i mean they're they're, they're never perfectly uh, precise and uh and so uh, theories of, I mean, vagueness are in principle relevant to the the law because um, because there are going to be cases, you know, w w where um, you know the, the, these examples will come up. I mean, so for example, you know, if somebody left left some money um, to be distributed equally among, you know, all the, the bold. Um, students at Bristol University, <laughs> then you know, then the the uh, the application of the term bold, you know, have to be uh, cons to be considered. But um, but what's I mean, I've I've been involved in you know in various workshops and so on with, with legal philosophers. And what's actually rather frustrating about those discussions is that, of course, the law ha has to have ways of dealing with vagueness, but it it never seems to deal with it by just recognizing this is a case where the law is vague and we might as well toss a coin. It's, it's what is actually done in practice in the courts um, is that they have a quite elaborate set of principles about um, the burden of proof uh, as well, who's, you know, who, who, who has to prove their case and, you know, and whose case just wins by default, um, and and so all the cases that look like cases of vagueness are handled, as far as I can see, by by that kind of principle, by by, by as it were by procedural means rather than by directly confronting the phenomenon of of vagueness, um, and and so it, it, it's actually. It's it's a it's a less good test of, of theories of vagueness than one might hope because I mean obviously it'd be nice to to see well you know which which theory of vagueness are these judges using, um, and but but that isn't how it works. So there 
they, they're using principles which are complete, I mean, the, the way they proceed is perfectly consistent with the, the view of, of vagueness that I like, but it would, it would be hard to argue that it was inconsistent with other views. I mean, it, it, it's, it, they're, they're handling it in a different kind of way. Professor Williamson. Yeah, uh, so I just, just one thing. Ah, I mean, okay. not doing is, that they're not saying, look, there is no truth of the matter here. Yeah. So I wanted to thank you for your time, because uh, uh, I initially said one hour and I don't want to go overboard with, uh, with your time. Uh, so it was a pleasure talking to you, and uh, I'll send you and, the, and the you, link soon. Yeah. All right, right, have a good day. Right. And you, bye. bye.